Happy, healthy, beautiful Tuesday to you guys. Hope you're having a great day. We're, today, we're going to be talking about nutrition habits to lead you towards your best year yet. I'm joined by Dr. Bob Rakarski, clinical nutritionist, 33 years in the game of functional medicine and clinical nutrition, taking athletes, world-class athletes to be their best, but also allowing people to come back to health who've been sent home to die by the medical institution because they had no more answers because they weren't looking at root cause like functional medicine really does. So, our personal goal this year is to impact the lives of 100,000 people around the globe with simple, powerful concepts that can touch lives in ways you couldn't even imagine. But we're going to get down to business here. Dr. Bob, first of all, I want to welcome you to this call. Thank you, as always, for giving up your time to share your expertise, your wisdom, your knowledge. So when it comes to nutrition, Dr. Bob, I know a lot of people would struggle and stress about nutrition and what to eat you know, coming up, especially in the new year, why do you think it's such a struggle for a lot of people to know what to eat, but also to stay disciplined? I'm going to address both those things. We're actually led to believe that, you know, health can be easy. It's in a package, it's in a potion, it's in a pill. And, you know, what we've come to find out very, very simply is probably processing of foods has really been the, the downslide of the health of humanity. We start looking at how much has human biochemistry changed since the beginning of humanity? Almost not at all. You start looking at what's going on, maybe a little more gluten sensitivity, but that's gone up 400% since the genetic modification of gluten. But how much has the food sources changed? And, and that's exponentially. There's a book, In Defense of Food, written by Michael Pollan, that there's a very powerful line in it, you know, and it says something strange started happening around the world in the 1970s. He said food started flying off the shelf of food markets and being replaced by food-like substances. It looked like food, it smelled like food, it may have even taste like food, but it wasn't food. It was just a bunch of chemicals. He would even say, you know, you go back prior to 1970, you buy a loaf of bread and you might find five ingredients on it. After 1970, you find 35 ingredients, 30 of them you can't pronounce. So what's hmm. going on here? Someone sold the, the story, Better Living Through Chemistry, and we welcome where chemistry is appropriate, but if you are getting an abundance of chemicals rather than natural substances, you're going to suffer. Maybe not right away, but in time, you're not going to feel anywhere near as good as you could, and you're likely to have some serious degeneration going on in some system or process in your body. And why Thank discipline? You. Well, Kelly Brownell, Yale University said this. He said, food in this country is engineered to be addictive. How did they engineer that? They either refine the sugar, that's profoundly addictive, or they put in other chemicals that'll drive dopamine uh, and they hook people to their product. That's what they want. They want people to do it again and again. And I recall first learning about food addiction when I was a kid, there was these potato chips. I don't know if they were Jays or Lays or one or the other, but they said, you can't eat just one. You know, I remember mm -hmm. this scientist saying, is that a threat? You know, are you going to make me addicted to your product after just one? Well, for so many people, or sadly, that did happen. So we've got a, a global problem here of malnutrition. Yeah, and, and there's something you mentioned about discipline as well. This this dopamine hit. I see a lot of people with addictions to pornography, addictions to refined foods, with just bad habits across the board, which really just are pleasure driven. Well, you mentioned this before, people are driven towards pleasure and away from pain, but there's a heck of a lot to be learned from a bit of discomfort and a bit of pain, right? That's some real wisdom to realize that we're biologically wired to seek pleasure and to avoid pain. But then there's this wonderful fact that says all growth occurs outside of your comfort zone. Probably everybody watching this in some way pushed through some barrier to grow in a certain way. And they realized if they didn't put up with discomfort and often consistent, repeated discomfort and adapted discomfort, they were not going to achieve the life that they wanted. Dr. Phil Stutz has gotten a lot of press recently because Jonah Hill you know, he was over 300 pounds and really struggling when he when he met this psychiatrist. And he said, you know what, change your relationship to pain uh, and begin to embrace pain that will move you in a better direction. Now, is there some type of dysfunctional pain that people can embrace? Well, there's always extremes, but that's going to be a very small set of the population. Most of us, we can learn to embrace a pain that's going to make us better. And, you know, I was listening to Tony Robbins because he was on uh, a great podcast called Impact Theory. And the guy said, well, Tony, I know you're a big fan of cold plunges, he says, but I've done it, you know, 13 straight months. And I finally stopped. I was just plain miserable. There was nothing enjoyable about it. 
And Tony said, well, that's one of the differences between you and I and people that would succeed with or people fail. You felt like it, what it was going to feel like to get in, what it was going to feel like to deal with it. I felt I would always focus on how I felt after, which was basically empowered and nearly invincible. People have done that. They get out, they realize, wow, I feel alive. Was that comfortable? No way. Do I look forward to it? No way. Not the process, but the after, the after is really good. And we might say that about diet. We might say that about exercise. There's so many things that will move us forward that, you know, they're not going to be very pleasant. And then we go to the common denominator of success, a very classic book. One thing he said is people who are successful, they actually make a habit of doing things that unsuccessful don't do. Do they like them? No. Successful people want pleasing results. Unsuccessful people tend to go with pleasurable actions. So big difference. Uh, displeasing actions can lead to much better results. And can you learn, learn to love the displeasing? Well, yeah, absolutely you can. You know, you're, you're a classic example of that with your training that obviously takes it to the limit. But can we all do that? I believe we can. I believe we can. Certainly, yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's something special in movement and moving your body as well. It gives a communication for you to eat better and eat the food you know you need to be eating. And I think a lot of times if people fall into that comfort eating, if they're dealing with some emotional trauma they didn't deal with healthily, that they may lean on food or they may find that food is some degree of a comfort, but it actually becomes a bit of a downfall, you know, people get into eating disorders or having issues with body image or, you know, just not really overcoming their perspective on what is healthy eating and accepting food as, as a healthy part of our lives. And now I start to see some things that kind of boils my blood on social media with, with certain celebrities now that skinny is back in, like thin is back in, you know, and this kind of stuff really annoys me because it, it, it's like a trend. There shouldn't be a trend when it comes to nutrition. There shouldn't be a trend when it comes to health. It should be the get the basics down, have a good body image, good self image, get some good information and don't be so focused with the aesthetics. But I think there's a lot of reverse engineering and really ridiculous marketing that's done by, by I would say, influencers to just turn people in, in, a, in a bad direction. What, what would you say, to, what advice would you give to people on that? You know, because it's constantly in front of people's faces disconnect from it completely. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're products of our environment and there's some simple quotes that go way back. I think Mark Twain said, I can resist anything except temptation. And you look at all these advertisements, they are not selling us something good for us, period, end of story. And why? Because there's not much money in what's good for us. Now, with that said, picture that wellness is now a multi-trillion dollar industry. So let's say it's maybe two or three trillion a year. And that's all the things related to wellness. Chronic illness is a 30 plus trillion dollar a year approaching, you know, they estimate by 2030, a 50 trillion dollar a year industry. Classic example, I, I had a patient in today uh, and just shocking, let's say fairly young by my standards, just, just turning 40, but taking 13 different drugs and started on some of those 20 years ago because someone didn't get after root cause. If you keep working, bypassing the problem without addressing it, it gets worse and worse and worse. And it's led to multiple surgeries, more medications, medical disability. And, and I don't believe any of that needed to happen. You know, we can't turn back the clock, but I'll tell you what, when you dig that big a hole for yourself, it takes a whole lot more effort to get out of it. So if someone is trying to sell you a shortcut, I'm not against smart cuts, but I am against shortcuts. Stephen Covey used to say, think about the law of the farm. You can't cram for the harvest. You can't go out the week before the harvest, plant and nurture and all this other stuff. You're getting no harvest. There's a, a preparation season. There's a planting season. There's a protection season. And then there's a production season. And just depends on what you're trying to grow. If it's a carrot, you got 80, 90 days. If it's a human, we're talking 270 days. You look at these epic goals like Bob Proctor, you know, his, what was his time frame on his? 47 years. I don't think he originally planned on 47 years, but thank God he lived that long and was able to contribute to the world. But hey, the bigger and better you want to go after, the likely the longer incubation period and the more challenge you're going to have to deal with to get there. But very, very, very doable. I like that analogy of harvesting. You know, I think we're constantly harvesting. We're growing and laying seeds, either good seeds on 
good ground, good seeds on thorny ground, bad seeds on good ground. Or I think, you know what, there's always that light and dark though in life. We're always going to be yeah. dealing with, with, with the counter of, of that good. But how impactful is nutrition, Dr. Bob, for, for our generations to come and not just ourselves today, but how impactful is it for those next generations? Well, I, I'm glad you put it that way because it's the number one cause of death malnutrition is, and it has been for a long, long time. And it's, it's shifted. There was a time where people didn't have food. And that of course is horrible, but that's starvation. And what we have now is what's called overconsumption under nutrition. You know, we've depleted the soil. We depleted globally the mineral resources. So food doesn't have what's in it, what was once in it. When people don't get the nutrition they need, they keep eating, they keep eating, they keep getting overweight. And that just quite simply makes things worse. But since you start talking about multiple generations, you know, this concept of epigenetics has really been evaluated deeply over the course of the last couple of decades. And we know that the influence of stress, the influence of toxins, the influence of malnutrition, it's documentable through effects on four different generations. Uh, and if people want to see the effects of, of malnutrition, go to YouTube and type in Pottinger cats and, mm. and a very powerful study. This started in the 1940s where they were doing adrenalectomy procedures on cats. Cats could live without their adrenals and they were using an extrenal extract for human health. Uh, and they got so many cats donated that they didn't have enough of the food to feed the cats. So ultimately they were paying feeding the cats a processed diet, meat plants and milk plants started uh, donating raw meat scraps, raw milk. And the animals that got raw meat, raw milk, they realized, wow, they came re uh, much better out of surgery. They thought, what's going on here? And so they followed it through the generations. You know, first generation cats on a processed diet got sicker. Second generation cats were sicker much earlier in life, like a juvenile getting a serious illness like cancer or, you know, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. The third generation was born sick uh, and there was no fourth generation. Sick animals, they were so, gone so far that they said, okay, you're not healthy enough to reproduce, no reproduction. And think about that. Sick animals don't reproduce, sick plants don't reproduce, sick humans don't reproduce. So one of the solutions is health and reproductive medicine, you know, in vitro clinics, all kinds of things, they're popping up all over because we have a global infertility problem. You know, about one in 10 women, uh, and we're finding out when couples pursue fertility treatments here in the States, one third of the time it's the male. So, you know, this is horrible. This, this is really a bad thing for humanity. Yeah, you know, something popped into my mind there when you're just talking about generations. I remember reading some papers around a biochemist's work back in the early 1900s about having food groups or actually eating types, having, you know, identifying three different eating types that people would have based on their ancestors, based on where they grew up in the world that we don't expect to eat or do as well on a, on a diet that's, let's say, from from Asia or from let's say Alaska or somewhere, we have to usually eat based on where we grew up and what our ancestors ate. You know, now it seems that there's so many diets out there that people get more and more confused of what they should be eating. Is there a particular pattern of eating or diet that people should avoid? Processed, that's for sure. But so this leads to a, a fun topic because I was part of, there's a, a conference called the Swiss Conference and there was a nutrition panel where they were talking about diet for athletes. And there was probably 10 of us on the panel, you know, including PhD researchers, you know, people that were really deep in, in, into what was going on. And so here's a strange thing. So the moderator asked the question, well, there must be some way to figure out the best diet for the person rather than trial and error. And you know what? All 10 of us that were on the panel said, well, if there is, we haven't figured it out yet. Because literally, you are going to be different next week than you are today. Are you going to be better or are you going to be worse? That's going to be based on your habits and you start looking. But now what you said is very, very powerful and seems to match. Eat like your ancestors ate. Uh, and when I go through dietary guidelines, Michael Pollan said this, he said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Well, I tweak that. I say, eat real food, not fake food, clean food, not genetically modified, not intoxicated with herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, 
real food, clean food, not too much, not too often. So calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, every color, every day, people that are doing a very limited diet, they're not getting every color, but every color has a different blend of nutrients. Even though we've named the 50 essential nutrients, there's this term conditionally essential. And here's what I can tell you. I believe that plant nutrients are conditionally essential for all of us and more so than ever. Bruce Ames, geneticist out of Berkeley said this, he said, people that eat the most fruits and vegetables, this is studied over decades, get the least cancer. Those that eat the least get the most. And then ultimately we go with mostly plants. So let me summarize that again, without interrupting what I said, eat real food, eat clean food, not too much, not too often, every color, every day. Oh, I forgot to throw in, in a way that honors your genetics, your physiology and your body goals, mostly plants. When we go through all that, some might say that's really complex. Well, just stay in the produce section, uh, honor your body, eat in a way that feels good. You know, if you're connected to your body, you'll know what feels good and what doesn't. Just on that, you said mostly plants, yep. but I would love to highlight the importance of flesh foods. And I yeah, know, you know, with, uh, with the with the surge of veganism, in theory, it's it's a good idea. But I think if the animals are treated better and we're having better quality animals, then we're not going to have as much problem with all the commercially raised produce. So, so just on that, can you just touch on you know have you have you met people that have done really well on an exclusive plant based based diet? No. No, you know, I, I mean, people give it a shot for a period of time and then they go, oh, I guess I do need vitamin B12, you know, and they can do, you know, a, a supplement or or they can realize that that is from animal sources. And there might be a source of algae that they figured out makes a little bit of B12. But throughout human history, there really hasn't been a society that does that. They usually eat a little fish now and then they'll they'll get into themselves and they'll honor. But let's take that for a moment. The sickest people that I see very, very simply are vegetarians that don't eat vegetables. So what does that mean? They're living on grains. They're like grain-tarians, you know? And they're just an inflammatory mess falling apart and they're thin, fat people. And, you know, people really have to go the extra mile and really supplement out of their mind to thrive on a plant-based diet. You know, I, I put something on my YouTube channel, you know, about what type of diet is appropriate. For and just, let's just look how we're made. So I've got these canines. You know, these are for tearing flesh. Why, why are they there? Well, for tearing flesh. I've got these molars, uh, and that's for grinding plants. Why are they there? Well, they're for grinding plants. Uh, and then if you were to evaluate a vegan's digestive tract, well, you look at a cow, they have five stomachs. And, and why? Because it needs to be there for a period of time. And they keep eating and throwing up and chewing it again and throwing it up in their mouth. I mean, people may not know what that is, but that's ruminating. That's what these ruminants do, because that's what it literally takes them to get the nutrients out of that. And they have a really long digestive tract. You know, now we're also not lions and, and we don't have that short digestive tract. And people say, well, lions sleep 20 hours a day. Well, it's king of the jungle. They don't worry about too many predators. But I, I don't think it's that they don't have much energy. But what are we? Well, we're hybrids, hybrid mouth, high, hybrid digestive tract. And when we start looking at the nutrients we need, we have to have both. Now, are there people that eat way too much meat? Well, probably so. But yet now that they're starting to look at the carnivore diet, there's some pretty extreme cases of people that have seemed to thrive on it. Whether we're talking about Jordan Peterson, sure. Mi Michaela Peterson, his daughter. You know, I was on a on a Zoom, a semi-private Zoom with Sean Baker, the medical doctor that wrote the carnivore diet. You know, he says a lot of good things, but you know, hey, he's early on. If, if you've only been doing something for a decade, and I have to wonder if he gets any plants in there at any point in time, you know, but I think what they found out very, very simply is we've got more bugs in our gut than we have cells in our body. And if you do too much of one thing, you're going to get an extreme imbalance in the microbiome that may for a period of time start moving you to a way where you feel better. But I think long term, it's going to create challenges. So we'll find out, you know, if people could, I always, you know, I've been now saying for more than three decades, if I could teach people one thing. I teach them to listen to your body. Hey, eat that food. Let's see if your pulse goes up. Let's see how your endurance is. Let's see how your strength is. Let's see how your balance is. Let's see how your sleep is. Those aren't complex things to look at. We can all do it. And here's what I can tell you. When you when you eat the right diet for you, all those things get better. Uh, and if it, you 
if you eat the wrong diet, some of those, if not all of them, get worse. It's just a matter of really being able to pay attention. Yeah, it is really listening, isn't it? I, I had a couple of clients, uh, I, I actually jokingly call them hardcore vegans. And I said at the start of our conversation and working together, I said, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say you shouldn't eat the way you want to eat. But what I would say is, instead of being uh, a vegan, be a flexitarian, mm. open yourself to the idea of listening and feeling your way through the process because some of the work with me is going to be energy expending and some is going to be energy surplus or adding so on the energy expending days if you have an urge to eat an animal braised product follow it and see how you feel if you don't feel good then come back from it but if you do then that's probably what your body needs rather than just adopting this because that's what you feel is best. So I would encourage everyone watching this, be open to adapt to your body's needs. Put yourself to the test, make a journal, see how you feel on any given week. And you know, also you, you introduced the, the basics of food combining, Dr. Bob, before. And I really love that because for a long time, I was just shoveling food into my face and not really paying attention to what order things were going. Could you just touch on the basics of food combining and why is, why is it important? Sure. So food combining means that certain things will have complementary digestive processes, meaning you get them together, you're going to be efficient. If you have eat things that are not complementary, actually antagonistic, well, then you're actually going to pay a price in terms of digestive efficiency, bloating, creating toxic metabolites, not getting the maximum nutrient absorption. Uh, and you start looking at fruit, you know, fruit is 90, 95, or even more percent water. So it's very, very easy to digest. And, you know, those should always be eaten alone. Uh, you start looking at vegetables. They're very, very flexible. You can eat vegetables, you know, really nice green veggies or, or multicolors, not white, unless we're talking like jicama or, or cauliflower. Those are the exceptions. Uh, but you can eat vegetables with starches, like a potato, a yam even grains, if you're one that does grains, you can eat vegetables with protein and the digestion is really, really well. But the two antagonistic processes are starches and proteins simultaneously. Uh, and, you know, I don't know where this was first described, but one of my great mentors, one of my early mentors, this was, you know, one of the first functional medicine doctors ever to work with the U.S. Olympics. This guy was elite. He treated royalty. He treated world champions. Uh, and he made a statement, you know, 30 plus years ago at a conference. He says, you know what, literally, I will be able to look at you a decade from now and tell if you've been combining your foods properly. It'll make that big a difference in your overall health, wellness, efficiency, everything Everything else. Uh, and that really stuck with me. Now, do I perfectly combine every meal? No. Am I at least nine out of 10? Yeah, I'm at least nine out of 10. But every once in a while, I have a little something that doesn't match. So maybe the 90% rule matches there. You know, if you're 90% perfect, that's probably going to be okay for most people. But keep in mind, I'm, pro I'm probably that in all, all areas of my life, 90% plus. So I might have an advantage there in that I've learned from great people. There you go. And, and that's it really is giving yourself a little bit of freedom in there as well. This is not the perfectionist game. You will make mistakes, you will make errors. But I think if things are too restricted in life, that's when you get rebellion. So restriction equals rebellion. Flexitarian equals enjoy your life, get the basics down, but allow yourself to have a treat and work for that treat, you know, really encourage your get your body moving, you know, really work for that treat rather than resenting yourself for having the treat, because I think that's really what people do if they don't work for those treats. But I know I'm just conscious of time, Dr. Bob, I'd love to ask, why should people be investing in organic vegetables and grass fed meats instead of just going with commercially raised? Well, we're beginning to see that that Probably the food industry, you know, if you look in the U.S., we have the food and drug industry. Well, they're hand in hand. The food is making them sick. The drugs are keeping them sick. And what have we seen? Just a severe deterioration where chronic disease is normal. Right? Six out of 10 U.S. adults have a chronic disease. Four out of 10 have two or more to the tune of just 3.5 trillion U.S. alone. And again, globally, about 10 trillion. So the more processed the diet, the worse off the individual is, period, end of story. But what is part of the processing? Well, when they start mass producing these products, they use herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and then someone got the idea, you know, if we genetically make modify the plants so that it cannot be killed by toxins, we can use more toxins to try to stave off the insects. Uh, interestingly enough, what they found out very, very simply is if a plant is really healthy and really organic, the bugs don't bother it. 
It has the immune system. It's got the protective coats. And it's very fascinating to see what do the pests go after? Weak plants. And when we spray them, when we intoxicate them, when we genetically modify them, we make them weaker, weaker, weaker. And there's so many other factors there. So you are actually contributing to a degradation of the entire ecosystem if you're supporting anything other than organic. And not only is the nutrient density higher within those plants, not just the vitamins, minerals, amino acids, proteins, carbohydrates, fat, fiber, and water, but also the phytochemicals. And certain phytochemicals, you know, like resveratrol, you know, there was studies out of Harvard and the guy that was studying that sold his company for, you know, something like $700 million because the drug companies thought, well, there's got to be a way to make a drug out of resveratrol, which by the way, the highest resveratrol is under organic grapes in harsh circumstances like, you know, ice wine circumstances. So the harder the plant has to work to thrive, the more hardy it is and the better it is for those that eat us. Those plants that don't have to do anything to thrive and survive, they've never developed an immune system. And as a result, we don't get anything from it. So the technical term is xenohormesis. If you've got a plant that had to, to really struggle to survive, it's going to be hardy. And that goes with animals too. Plants are animals that don't, they're just plain weak. And when you're eating weak plants and animals, you become a weak animal, just not a good outcome for anybody. And also in the fats as well, all those toxins are stored if you're if in those meats. So if you're cooking the, in the fats into the, that commercially raised animal into your foods, that's really, really a bad situation for your, for your organs. But in regards to supplementation, Dr. Bob, we understand the world is depleted in nutrients and it's not a case of if, it's a case of you should supplement. Obviously, reishi is our top supplement or nutritional aid for, for baseline of nutritional support. We love it. We're building an international global organization, sharing it, and we're pumped about that. And full disclosure, this is a win-win situation. The more people we help, the more people we can bring back to a state of balance, the more it's a win for everyone. And that's the way the world should be, is serving others and you get rewarded for that. So we're really pumped about being able to do such a thing in such a, a great way. But could you list what are some of the baselines of nutritional support that people should have? And why is reishi so powerful for bringing our nutritional vitality levels up? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell a story. Uh, so I was lecturing in Orlando, Florida, sometime in the early 2000s after the PhD researcher Barry Sears came out with his book, The Zone. And he was the primary keynote and he went before me. So I actually built in on his presentation. He put up a copy then of what was known as the USDA Food Pyramid, US Department of Agriculture Food Pyramid. And his statement was so powerful and it just rings through my head today. If ever there was a terrorist-like plot designed to destroy the health of the world, this would be at the food pyramid. So I created my own food pyramid after that. And by the way, my own life pyramid as well. But since I'm a big fan of sevens, there's seven rungs of the food pyramid. And the base is going to be food. You know, if God made it, it's okay. If man made it, stay away. That's a good rule there. Then we go to superfoods. What are superfoods? These are like foods wearing superhero capes because they have a blend of botanicals that are so powerful at enhancing human health. And you start looking at ratio, also known as Ganoderma, over 3,000 published medical studies, over 5,000 years of clinical use. And you look at all the things it can do, people just marvel, how can this be so powerful? Well, it's the top supplement tool in God's pharmacy, if we want to say it then, you know, and then I go with medical foods or functional foods. And there's even functional beverages like functional coffee. There's over a thousand studies on functional coffee. If you infuse coffee with nutrition, people can get a wonderful benefit from it. And that's by the way, where we put our ratio, we put it in coffee and tea because people do that every day. Then I go ahead and I go with a multivitamin, multimineral, you know, very bioavailable, low dose, because it's going to be a first do no harm strategy that may well help someone stave off chronic illness. I used to say omega-3s, but now I'm going to go with the activated omega-3s, the resolving form of omega-3s. Again, this was Nobel Prize nominated research and advancement in nutrition science. And there are some resolvents that naturally occur in nature. And we're finding out more of those, but people need to get these resolving omega-3s in their system. Then we're going to go with the probiotics. And I used to have just D3 at the top of the pyramid, but now we know that D3 and K2 work better. And if people cover all these rungs, Here's what I found. I don't care if you're a world-class professional athlete, we can take your game up stronger. If you're fighting for your life, we can start that process and move you forward. And I say that after 30 plus years of doing this, you know, and so it's not an if, 
do I need it? It's like, are you willing to make the investment of your health to get your best life? Because I believe it's absolutely impossible to get it without supplementation. And literature supports that as well. Beautiful. Guys, I see a number of questions, about six or seven questions coming in both on both platforms. We can't address them now, guys. We have to make a, a stop on the call. But what I would ask you to do is drop me a message either on Instagram or on Facebook with your question. And we'll ask Dr. Bob if he can be so kind as to make a reels around that question over the coming week so we guys can get that addressed in more depth as well. So call to action on this, guys, if you haven't uh, really grasped anything from the call, the recording will be available for you guys to digest it, pardon the pun on that, uh, later in the week. Um, we would also encourage you guys to try our one box challenge of Reishi, get back to the person who invited you to this call to get an experience with this so you can feel this helping your system to balance out for yourself. Dr. Bob, for yourself, I'd just like to hand it over to you to close out the call. Thank you so much. So many nuggets in there for us to, to ponder and to put into action. So it's up to you guys. Put some of this, this information into action and we'd love to hear from you guys in the chats afterwards to see what you like best. So Dr. Bob, I'll hand it over to you just to wrap up the call. Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with a couple of different quotes. Confucius, 5,000 years ago, said, life is really simple. We insist on making it complicated. Uh, and another quote, progress is the complication of simplicity. So when you start looking at, is health easy? Yeah, you eat right, you drink right, you think right, you move right, you sleep right, you poop right, you talk right, and you're going to be there. How many people do that? Not enough. But with the right information and certainly the right structure of support system, and that matters, you know, you can get there better. And I like to finish with four questions. First question is why? Why did you invest the time to be with us today? There's so many other things you could do. Second question is the answer to the first. Why not? You know, uh, we've got literally the Irish Superman and someone who's got a background in three plus decades of, of helping people, whether they're dying or whether they're world champions and everything in between. There's got to be something of value in there for you. Third question is, why not you? Someone's going to grab a hold of this and say, you know what? This makes perfect sense. I'm going to do the best thing for my body. And by getting better, stronger, faster, smarter, I'm going to have a spillover effect on my community. And you know, if we do enough of that, we can make a better world. And we certainly need it. I always ask, what would the last couple of worlds uh, years be like if the world was really healthy, it would have been a non-issue. You know, oh, someone got a little sniffle, okay. Or maybe someone in their late 80s who was on the way out got a bug and that was the end of them. That would have been what this would have been all about. But what do we have instead? A bunch of people that are so sick that a little bug comes by and they just get frightened out of their mind. Well, you know, listen, if you're in that circumstance, we're here to help you know, and, and we can get there together. We can get there. So the final question is why not now? The longer you wait to act on information, the least likely you are to act on it. So whatever you found that makes sense to you, start applying it. And if we can help you in any other way, reach out. And as always, I'm Dr. Bob Rakowski, absolutely knowing that we can all be happy, healthy, and successful. So in that part of the world, good night and God bless. In this part of the world, Good afternoon and God bless. Enjoy this epic, beautiful, amazing, wonderful day.